from Studio A at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California. This is The Hot Seat, and you're in it with me, Max Schwartz. It starts right now. On Skype, for our second Skype interview, I have founder, CEO, and editor-in-chief of the Fair Observer, fairobserver.com, Atul Singh. How are you, Mr. Singh? Thank you very much for calling in, for Skyping into The Hot Seat today. It's a pleasure to have you. Well, it's a pleasure to be on The Hot Seat, Max. Uh, it's always good to talk to you. Thank you, and we are happy to finally have, be able to have you on the program. So, and just so our viewing audience knows, Fair Observer is a nonprofit publication that has reporters stationed around the world that explains why things happening and not what's happening. Would that be an accurate representation? Yeah, we look at the deeper issues behind the news, provide context and multiple perspectives, and we have a thousand five hundred people from over 40 countries. Uh, we are very much, um, uh, let's say, the newer, fresher, younger, more global, more diverse version of The Economist. Excellent. So uh, you, you, you guys go to the younger demographic? Yes, of course. Uh, the average age of the reader of The Economist is 54. I think our readers are uh, mostly in their 20s and 30s. Okay. And Starting right away now, because we have a lot of important questions and not a lot of time, let's yes. start. So starting, starting with the Islamic State, also known as ISIL and ISIS, from your perspective as a former member of the Special Ops Force in India, do you believe ISIL is beatable? Absolutely. It is beatable. It's a fanatical organization which will eventually lose public support because the kind of vision they have for society is fundamentally inhuman. At some point, people will tire of them and will look for a more humane, a more tolerant, and a more open society. You must remember that all fundamentalist uh, movements have run out of steam, whether it was communism, whether it was uh, the Puritan Revolution in England, uh, even Calvinist um, Switzerland couldn't sustain itself for too long. So it's a question of time, of course. Um, uh, if we act wisely, they will lose uh, faster. If uh, we act unwisely, they will last a little longer. So do you think that the international community sh should start treating the Islamic State or should treat them as a legitimate nation that we're at war with? Or no, no, is no, no, it no, a... Not at all. Not at all. Actually, uh, there are many, many, many assumptions in that question which I'd like to question. First, what is the international community? Well, the answer to that is a little tricky. On, on surface, it's a comedy of nation states or states from around the world. In reality, all of these states have different uh, motives, different uh, strategic uh, imperatives. And really, the international community exists more in fiction than in fact. Um, Having said that, um, should this uh, community, as embodied by the United Nations, recognize Islamic State? Well, no, that would be a horrendous move because this is fundamentally an organization that is inhuman, that is raping, that is plundering, that is pillaging, that is destroying ancient uh, heritage for all humanity, such as Palmyra. So, uh, there can be no um, acceptance of this organization. Um, they, a line has to be drawn literally in the sand, and eventually they have to wither away. Well, oh, President Obama said there was a line in the sand, or he did with Syria. He didn't follow it. Do you think that the international community has, or what you define as the international community, do you believe that they have drawn a line in the sand, or has, is this an ongoing <laughs> conflict? Look, 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 I mean, I, 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 let's take a step back, Max, right? Let us take a step back and ask ourselves, why is there a conflict? Well, the conflict that exists in, in that region is, is, is an ethnic conflict. It began as an uprising, which was against, uh, uh, let's say, corrupt states. But in reality, it is now an ethnic conflict. Iraq has imploded. Uh, the nation state of Iraq doesn't exist. Kurds have a de facto independent existence. Uh, the Shias uh, who run Baghdad and who are backed by uh, Tehran, uh, which is Iran's capital, they want payback for all the years during um, which they were 
literally gassed and killed by Saddam and his Sunni henchmen. And, and the Sunnis who remember the times when they were the big bosses of Baghdad are, are, are reacting violently and they have fused with the Sunnis in Syria who don't like an Alawite ruling them. And Alawites um, are a Shiite sect to which Assad belongs. And so very conveniently, um, these uh, tribesmen, uh, Sunni tribesmen in both Syria and Iraq, uh, who were discontented, have uh, ended up uh, somehow uh, supporting the Islamic State, uh, even when they don't like the Islamic State, because uh, they have um, access to grind and vendettas uh, to carry out, and they prefer the Islamic State to Damascus or Baghdad. Uh, so the situation in the Middle East is like the Thirty Years' War in Europe, uh, which occurred between 1618 to 1648. There are too many actors, there are too many um, foreign players, there are too many conflicting uh, motives, um, and the Russians are there bombing the hell out of the Islamic State now. They are even putting troops in Syria. So it's fascinating uh, right, uh, what is happening. Um, and of course, you have uh, everyone else in the picture. And remember, a lot of countries, um, such as Turkey, have been suspected to be soft on the Islamic State uh, until very recently. Their tanks uh, were at uh, Kobani when the Kurds were fighting for their lives and they refused to intervene. Saudi Arabia is under strong suspicion for uh, supporting Islamic State at least uh, during the early days. And, I and even to, now... I just want to ask now, about the Russians. Just a second. Even now, the Saudis are not exactly, you know, above board. Uh, a lot of Saudi citizens might be, uh, you know, covertly, and maybe even elements of the state might be covertly uh, sympathetic to the Islamic State because it's a Sunni, Sunni organization that is uh, fighting uh, Iran, uh, their, um, their biggest power in the, re their biggest rival in the region. Yes, and it is interesting. Saudi Arabia is a, a unique ally for the United States. In and Supposedly, of itself. it's an ally. I, I think it's an ally that, uh, that uh, ca uh, causes the U.S. Uh, as much harm as good. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. But my main question, my main follow-up to that is, the Russians, you, are the Russians, the Russians, it make, they make it seem like they're there for one reason, but it appears that they're only trying to support Bashar al-Assad. That's How correct, has... but, but, but wait a minute. Uh, everyone make, may make it out there for one reason. Uh, America made it out that it went to Iraq to promote democracy. In reality, it didn't. It didn't put in the troops on the ground, and it didn't uh, uh, do the needful. It, it was um, a monumental blunder. So the point is that uh, the Russians are following their strategic imperative, which is to prop up Assad. If Assad goes, they lose their only ally in the Middle East. So they are going to kill everyone uh, Assad uh, dislikes to prop him up. Their strategic imperative is just to retain influence in that part of the world and distract everyone from Ukraine. The Russian Empire, and I wrote about it actually um, two weeks ago, is crumbling. They have to fight a rearguard action to keep that empire or memories of it alive. So uh, Russians are playing a very cold, cynical, and bloody game. They've played this before. Are they actually, are they fighting ISIL though, or are they more just trying to prop they, up Assad? They, 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 they have to fight Islamic State as well, because Islamic State is the biggest danger for Assad. So they are fighting everyone uh, uh, that uh, poses a threat to Assad. And what are your reporters? What are your reporters reporting? What has changed since the Russians got involved? And do they believe the Western airstrikes are actually working? Well, none of the airstrikes are working, Russian or Western. So airstrikes are a very cheap uh, policy when you don't want to put troops on the ground. So yeah, they may give you support, but eventually you need ground troops and. Really, um, I don't even know what Western means. Western, re in reality, is really America. So uh, the U.S. doesn't have a clue. The U.S. Um, has a very muddled policy uh, because it doesn't know what is policy. Philosophically, if we just examine what is policy, policy is just a set of means and measures to attain an end. The U.S. is unclear as to what its ends are in the Middle East. 
Now, you said, well, in some ways, Saudi Arabia, you disagreed with me, which is fine. But the point is, the U.S. is, and I can tell you that a lot of people in the CIA, yeah, people I know who are older and who've retired, have open misgivings about Saudi Arabia. Open. Mm -hmm. It's an open secret. Everybody in Indian intelligence is talking about it. Everybody in a range of other countries is talking about Saudi Arabia because the money that the Saudis have been pumping to promote a very fundamentalist kind of Sunni Islam is causing the radicalization of Muslims in many parts of the world. Now, the U.S. doesn't even know what it wants with Saudi Arabia. The U.S. Uh, says it wants to promote democracy, but democracy can lead to results that the U.S. doesn't like, such as the election of the Hamas. The U.S. also wants to maintain all the borders. Therefore, it says its support for the sovereignty of Iraq and Syria is, uh, is sacrosanct. But the reality is, is that these borders were created by Mr. Sykes and Ms. Upiko. They, they are going to change. The entire structure of the Middle East is crumbling. So the U.S. doesn't know what it wants and its motives are conflicting and therefore it cannot have a clear policy. The Russians, who are, let's say, more brutal and more cynical and more bloody-minded, have a clearer policy. All they want to do is prop up Assad and they will kill anyone who comes in the way. Yes, that's very true. And speaking of Saudis, and we're gonna, we'll move on now to the Middle East and the United States. Er, er, yeah. there, there seems to be, the, everyone sort of knows that there's Saudi Arabian money somehow in this election. We may not know exactly where it's going, but somehow <laughs> it's involved. Would you agree with that? <laughs> well, I don't know enough uh, to say that uh, Saudi Arabian money is there in this election, but I would suspect that money from all around the world is in play in this election because the U.S. election is a circus. Uh, it's a very expensive circus wherein every candidate will take every dollar they can get. So I'm sure money is coming not just from internal but external sources. I don't know enough to comment which what these sources are. And okay, M main point of my question being that which candidate? And first of all, I don't think Bernie Bernie Sanders says he doesn't take money from everywhere, and he claims not to have any super PACs. But staying on the topic so maybe of maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. So maybe you're right. I I I I I I I I I shouldn't generalize. Thank you for pointing that out. So perhaps there are some candidates who are worthier than others, and and actually don't take money from everyone. Yes, and we can have a whole conversation. We can have a whole interview just about campaign finance. But in, yes, <laughs> that's not what we intend to talk about, though. <laughs> oh, no. As it relates, though, to the Middle East, which candidates do you think would be the best and which candidates do you think would be the worst for the U.S. policy in the Middle East having to do with Iran and the Islamic State? Iran and the Islamic State. Well, that's a, the worst. It's, it's quite easy. I think the worst sort of people would be Ted Cruz and um, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, because they are a touch too fanatical and irrational. The best, we don't know really, because the uh, truth is none of them have, uh, uh, have focused too much on foreign policy. It's more um, uh, quick sound minute, uh, I mean sound bites and, and sloganeering. So um, I, I guess, uh, I guess uh, on the Republican side, uh, I, I uh, I suspect Marco Rubio is the most rational of all candidates. And on the Democrat side, um, I think Bernie Sanders uh, would be the best uh, um, foreign policy candidate, despite the fact that Hillary jumps around and uh, waves her creden credentials as Secretary of State all the time. Um, uh, but I think uh, the Clintons have been in power much too long, have too many vested interests, have too many conflicts of interest. So I think um, uh, for me, it is Marco Rubio on the Republican side and Bernie Sanders on the um, Democrat side. Okay, and moving on now to the other big Middle Eastern topic, which is the Iranian nuclear deal. And Iranian on... nuclear deal, yes. Okay. I've written about that too. I called it a good deal, by the way, if you remember the World This Week that I wrote. Yes, and speaking of, and it was adoption day, on yesterday or what yeah. October 18th do you yeah. what are your thoughts on this deal I think it's a fantastic deal I, 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 the US had no other alternative 
the Russians and the Chinese were itching to do business with the Iranians. The Indians, who were not part of the deal, were willing and eager to do business. The coalition was crumbling if it hadn't crumbled already. I think the U.S. managed to get, uh, um, if not all, almost all, all that it wanted. The Iranians just wanted uh, to save face, and and they've got all um, that uh, they've got basically most of what they wanted. And um, but remember, the big um, uh, the big uh, figure now in the Middle East is Islamic State, and the U.S. needs Iran to to act against the Islamic State. Remember, the it was. Um, it was the Iranians who literally helped uh, the Iraqi forces uh, take over Tikrit from the Islamic State. And the U.S. was providing air cover. So, I mean, de facto, the Iranians and the Americans are working together already. So, uh, it was time to make the affair public. They are in bed already. So, what's the point pretending you're enemies when you're sleeping on the side? Um, it was uh, a deal that was long overdue. And... Uh, and remember, America is not this pristine virgin uh, that was violated by Iran. In fact, the first act, uh, the first act uh, uh, or original sin um, that was committed in the Middle East is by, is by the Americans. The 1953 coup against Mossadegh in 1953 was a blunder of monumental stupidity. It was done at the height of the Cold War, wherein... People feared a communist under every bush, and uh, the first democratically elected leader of Iran was deposed in favor of a corrupt, autocratic, repressive king. Uh, the, Very good. The, the, just stu the stupidity of the coup beggars belief, and 1953 led to 1979. So I think um, under Obama um, and, of course, Kerry, the U.S. has been very wise to, to turn over a new leaf and say, you know, the past is the past and uh, these are new, the new realities and uh, we are going to uh, try and fashion uh, um, a, a, a more rational, reasonable policy of rapprochement because the U.S. or any, of, any other country simply cannot invade Iran. It's too big. Good, all very good points. Have your reporters said anything about changes on the ground since this deal ha since this deal was announced? Oh, yes, absolutely. We have a reporter in Tehran actually, Kurosh Ziabari, and uh, and uh, I have a huge number of Iranian friends, um, uh, some of whom um, uh, were my students uh, at Berkeley, and uh, in general, uh, almost. Um, almost unanimously, um, they have welcomed the deal. Um, it's been very interesting. Of course, there are some who, who, who don't like the deal, uh, because obviously the Iranian regime isn't the most uh, attractive regime. Um, it, um, its record on minorities or human rights um, is uh, far from, uh, far from um, that uh, of any uh, tolerable democracy, but then uh, bear in mind that the Iranians are much better than the Saudis. There's no comparison between the Iranians and the Saudis. The Iranian in Iran, uh, uh, women go to university. In fact, um, many many um, universities and many subjects have a majority of women students. Uh, Iranians can vote. Um, yes, it's not a perfect election, but still they can vote. Uh, their society has uh, much more opportunity. Education is largely free. So before we demonize Iran, we have to remember that uh, it is much, much, much better than an absolutist monarchy such as Saudi Arabia. So it's very hypocritical on the part of uh, American politicians and policymakers uh, to single out Iran uh, whilst turning a Nelson's eye to Saudi Arabia. Okay. And one final question on your native country of India. There was so much mm -hmm. hype around Prime Minister Nudi, uh, Moody when he was elected. Yeah. Has, has the hype died down and has he lived up to all of the expectations? Well, you can see the hype has gone now and people are starting to get disappointed with him. Because frankly, and I, and I interviewed uh, with my economics editor on, on Modi's economic performance in much detail, 
and I would suggest um, you read that article, India's, uh, uh, I think it's India's uh, uh, long quest uh, for modernity or something like that. Um, and what I point out is that Modi hasn't taken a single uh, big decision. He hasn't made a single um, substantive uh, legislative or institutional decision that uh, will push the Indian economy forward. And people elected him because of his record in Gujarat. They wanted jobs. They wanted a better life. They wanted lesser corruption. Now, yes, Modi gets the bureaucrats to come to office on time. Yes, uh, he's much more active than the previous prime minister, who was fundamentally, fundamentally um, a rubber stamp for the Nehru family. In fact, uh, at some stage, I remember I called the former Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh a eunuch. Um, and it was uh, because he, he, was, he was in office, but not in power. Now, certainly Modi is in power, but Modi has shown an absolute in in inability to first even uh, change retroactive legislation on taxation, which it scares um, all foreign investors. More importantly, domestically, um, he hasn't changed the Companies Act. He hasn't changed, swept away any of the 19th century colonial redundant legislation. He hasn't um, brought in uh, a new way of running, for instance, the finance ministry, which is still dominated by Indian administrative service bureaucrats who are a journalist service and generally know nothing. Did he One campaign on serving, changing all of those? Pardon me? Did he campaign on changing all of those? He campaigned on delivering results. And you cannot deliver results until you change an official machinery that doesn't work. And his cabinet is very thin on talent. The finance minister, Arun Jaitley, uh, probably uh, knows uh, precious little about finance, probably not even the F of finance. And, um, and uh, the team around him is suitably mediocre. Uh, Jayan Sinha, the Minister of State for Finances, is very street smart. He worked, he went to Harvard Business School and McKinsey, but he talks in cliches. He, he has nothing substantive to say in any of his speeches. So it's preposterous to me that uh, uh, a man who was elected with so much hope is pondering all that hope by... Uh, not making bold decisions and by choosing an incredibly mediocre team to, uh, to um, implement uh, whatever he decides. So I, Modi will be in trouble unless he changes the way he is going about business. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Mr. Singh, and thank you very much for joining us in the hot seat today via Skype. It was a pleasure to have you on, and as you mentioned earlier, it's a pleasure to speak with you whenever you have the time. The Hot Seat After Hours starts Max. right... Oh, my pleasure. The Hot Seat After Hours starts right now. You can email the Hot Seat Inbox at the Hot Seat with Max Schwartz at gmail.com, or you can tweet me at Max Schwartz TV. You can subscribe to the Hot Seat's newsletter by clicking on the link on our page. Go to annenbergradio.org slash podcast, and click on the link underneath the, uh, underneath the bottom of the description, at the bottom of the description, and enter your email address. Thank you very much for tuning in. You will, we'll see you next time with aviation journalist Brian Summers. From Studio A at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, good day.